Good evening, good evening. We are so glad you are here tonight uh, to celebrate and hear from one of the greatest uh, portrait painters of our time. My name is Mike Fernandez. I'm the Dean of the College of Entertainment and the Arts here at Lipscomb University. And I'm excited to be here. I know you're excited to be here. Just real quick, a few things. Uh, the College of Entertainment and the Arts here on Lipscomb's campus is, is a college that is a premier 21st century Christian arts training ground. We're very excited about the mission to get students to be able to create content that challenges culture, inspires culture, and uplifts culture. Uh, it's something that we take very seriously each and every day. Uh, and a key part of that training ground that we have here is, is enjoying nights like tonight, where we're able to bring in uh, premier artists who have legacy effect on culture. Uh, and we're dealing with someone who many consider uh, one of the greatest, most important working portrait artists of our time, Everett Raymond Kinsler. What an honor it is. Let's give him a quick round of applause before he comes out. Now, according to me, second to Everett Raymond Kinsler is Michael Shane Neal. Uh, Shane, as many of us call him, uh, is a powerhouse. He's a, a dynamic, wonderful person who's a creative artist, very gifted artist, and I'm, I'm proud to call him a friend. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to watch him do his work, and I'm proud and excited that he actually brought his studio here tonight for us. This is really, really cool. Um, so Shane is going to be leading us tonight, but before he does, I wanted to bring out a person who's very uh, important to Lipscomb, who's very, very special to me, uh, the 17th president of Lipscomb University, a, a man who has uh, led Lipscomb for 13 years to tremendous growth, a man who believes in the arts here at Lipscomb, a man who has invested a lot to make sure that art, music, theater, film are important parts of what we train to do here because he understands that artists can affect culture in power, powerful and positive ways. Please help me welcome Randy Lowry. Thank you. Well, let me welcome you and express uh, our tremendous appreciation for your being here, our joy that you came, and our anticipation that this will be a very memorable evening. A welcome to a college campus. You know, if you don't live on a college campus, you don't appreciate, I think, always the diversity of activity that takes place in a particular community in a relatively short period of time. I mean, we're celebrating this week, uh, having represented uh, all of Nashville's universities at the NCAA basketball tournament. And there's still a glow there. And, uh, Someone said, as I was walking into church on Sunday, boy, that must have been a hard game to sit through. I said, it was a great game to sit through. We were there. And uh, if you get a sense of what goes on there, 32 teams lost that weekend. Uh, but 64 teams got to represent 4,000 universities, and it was a wonderful moment. But you'll see flags right outside as you leave tonight. Those are the flags of students that represent 57 foreign countries. This is called Wow Week, and I have no idea what that stands for. Uh, but what we do this week is uh, celebrate culture in just a, a lot of ways. And then you weren't here for the tenseness of the morning as uh, a group of accreditors arrived. Uh, it's something like an IRS audit. And uh, they arrived, uh, but they will do good stuff. They will approve our new physician assistant program. And so this substantial program, new to Nashville, uh, in the cutting edge of what's happening in healthcare, our first class will begin in October. And then we come to tonight, uh, and in a completely different way, a completely different feel, a completely different field, we celebrate the arts. And that's just the joy of being on a campus like this. I think tonight is particularly impactful, even before it happens, to recognize uh, the power of a mentor and a mentee. Uh, the power of someone who is of one generation uh, sharing himself with someone of another generation. In five months, we'll welcome about 900 new students. I'll stand up here as they're gathered, scared to death, the first night before the academic world begins, 
And I'll give a little presidential speech, and in it I'll say, you are not the same as your faculty. Now, only in today's world do we have to remind 17-year-olds of that, uh, but sometimes you do, and I will say you are not the same as your faculty. And I'll talk about the faculty and their degrees and their institutions and their preparation, uh, and I'll try to scare them just a little bit to recognize there is some social distance, but then I'll go on and say, but if you're lucky, uh, if you handle this really well, uh, if you watch and listen and look, if you give yourself during this education process something very special may happen. And what may happen is a relationship with someone who will affect the rest of your life. And so we're going to see that on stage tonight. But we also are going to see and realize that it's happened in one generation that will be sitting on stage, but then it is translated to the next generation as our artist in residence, Michael Shane Neal, is a part of this community, giving again to the next generation of art students. It's an exciting relationship to think about. You're going to see it blossom this evening. Would you please welcome the person that two years ago began to think about this night and has done all the work to put it together and will introduce us to his mentor. Would you welcome Michael Shane Neal? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is so exciting to see you all, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it was 29 years ago that just across here at the Chrisman Memorial Library that I was instructed by my painting instructor, Dawn Whitelaw. I hope she's here. I don't see her. But yes, Dawn Whitelaw, wonderful artist. And Dawn suggested that I go and pick up a book in the library on an artist named Everett Raymond Kinsler. This, by the way, is the book. Look at it. And Dr. Lowry, just so you know, I have replaced the book in the library with a brand new one. So, um, but this is the actual book. And I sat down on the steps of the library, and I began to read it. And I didn't stop, and I stayed there all afternoon. And when I finished it, when I closed the cover, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be an artist. I want to be a painter like this guy right here. I, you, you can imagine that it never, ever would occur to me in a million years that I would actually get to meet him and then to think that not only would I meet him, he would later become my teacher, and then over time he would become one of my closest friends. The, the distance from Chrisman to New York City is, look at the book, it's falling apart. <laughs> I'm going to save that piece. The, the distance from Chrisman Library to New York is more than a million miles in my head. But it shows me that there is absolutely no dream you can't dream that cannot, I mean, that it can come true. It can really come true. And a bigger dream that I never could dream was that 100 yards from that library, that on this stage tonight, we would have the very man that was this tiny little picture in the corner of the book on stage here tonight. So please... Please welcome Everett Raymond Kinsler. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on in, sit, have a seat here. You don't need that old thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I? For my first number. <laughs> He's a true song and dance man, I can tell you. Well, um, Ev, it is really almost Why are you like, yelling at me? Am I yelling? <laughs> May I call you Ev? <laughs> Please. Yeah, I'll, tr I'll try not to yell. <laughs> He's been saying that everyone said all weekend how good he looks. He said, what do they think I am? Going to be dead? I mean, I don't understand this. Uh, you look better than ever. Thank you. Um, how's, your, I, how's your vision? My vision's not very good. Not very good. <laughs> what, I, what I'd like to do tonight is share a little bit with the folks some of your career. Uh, you can see right there on the monitor some of the pictures that we're going to show. And it's, it's sort of like a this is your life. We're going to walk all the way through. And uh, I'd like to begin a little bit with a shot of you uh, as a little kid. 
Which one is me? Which, which one is you? You're the one on the far right. <laughs> uh, you grew up where? Manhattan, New York City. And you've been there all your life? All my life. And this is your mom and dad. What were their names? Yes. Uh, Essie and Joseph. And, and they called you Everett. As they well. did. They, they did. called you Everett. Um, how sometimes, old you? sometimes honey. Honey. <laughs> how old are you in the photo? Ten? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, Maybe eight, ten. Eight or ten years old. I wanted to. This mention. is a picture of me later when I began. <laughs> a... When the blue of the night. Never mind. What? One of the things that has been amazing about his life is that from the time that he was a little bitty kid, he sort of has has touched on a lot of very important characters in American life. And believe it or not, this is one of them. Bing Crosby, if some of you that don't know who this is, Bing Crosby. Tell the story about uh, Bing Crosby calling you on the phone. Well, you know, one of the things that's been very revealing to me and sad is the fact that names and people are so forgotten. And that comes along with getting older, I guess. But Bing Crosby, um, to my children's generation was everything the Beatles were and uh, later Elvis Presley. Crosby was the premier popular, most popular singer of his day and I guess uh, without question music to this day as theater and movies have been a great part of my life. And I love Bing Crosby. And the story that's here was for an article from the New York Daily Mirror and I had something that I guess today would be called pneumonia at the age of about six. And I had an uncle who was a theatrical agent who used to play handball at a club in New York. And Bing Crosby came in one day. This was just 1932. Um, and it was probably the last time he ever appeared on stage. This is just around the time he went into the movies, became a major. For those of you who never heard of him, the one recording that still is the best-selling recording ever made was White Christmas with Bing Crosby. Uh, and he won the Academy Award a few times. But my uncle uh, had told him about a little boy, Everett Kinsler, who was six years old and was really pretty desperately sick with pneumonia. And Crosby said he would call me on the oh, phone. Yeah. And I remember, I remember this honestly, as clearly as I see you all, my mother and father took me into their bedroom and said, you're going to get a telephone call and I got on the phone and the voice quite a husky had a very distinctive baritone voice <clears throat> and um, he said is this Everett Kinsler I said yes we said this is Bing Crosby and I started to cry <laughs> and apparently the the emotion of the moment believe it or not the doctor said broke the fever <laughs> and then he was appearing at the Paramount Theater on Broadway and I remember going I really remember this he came out I remember I'm six or seven years old, and he looked ancient. He was probably 30, but he was wearing white duck trousers with a blue, very tan, very handsome. And there was a man there with a mustache, <clears throat> and he said, um, uh, your name is Everett? And I said, yes. He said, well, my name is Everett, too. And uh, he said, I'm Bing's older brother, was Everett Crosby. And so I met him, and, and it hit the newspapers, and that, that, that it was. But, but basically, they gave credit for being, for being able to heal a young boy from an illness by singing Well, to that's you what the, the doctor road. said. That's yeah, what the, the doctor said, that's right. It was good press for being crossed. And I'm here, so how bad could it be? <laughs> from, the, from the time you were a little boy, you loved to draw. I mean, that was one of your passions, yeah. was drawing yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an example of one of his drawings in 1938, so you're about 11 or 12 years old when you painted mm -hmm. this, drew this, pen and ink. And well, I, I have to interrupt you and tell you because it won't make much sense otherwise. I think. Um, when I was growing up, the American comic strip was a very, very vital force in this country. I don't know if any of you realize, but there's something called the Comic Convention, which takes place every year, uh, I think every or every two years, in Sa generally San Diego. I was invited out four years ago to get an award. I'd been away from comics for 50 years. And there were every day, I'm not making this figure up, there were 40,000 people a day for three days. And if my addition is accurate, that's 120,000 people who came to the comic convention who are comic book fans. And so the comic strip was a big, it's a very big part of our culture. I'm very passionate about this. 
My friend Tony Bennett, whom I was in high school with, um, grew up in what they call the big band era, where they did six, he'll tell you, he did six shows a day with one microphone. Well, the comic strip was so popular that it affected our culture. And there were three or four comic strips, Flash Gordon and George Lucas, mm. who did Star Wars, said when he did the first Star Wars that what influenced him most was growing up reading Flash Gordon. And then there was um, Prince Valiant, which was beautiful, beautiful drawings. The word I want you to, if you will, keep in mind, because it's part of my life, is the word narrative, storytelling. It's what Tony does with his music. He's a storyteller. And uh, I was very influenced by the American comic strip. And then there was a third strip called Terry and the Pirates, which was very popular. And we used to jokingly call dysentery in the pirates. <laughs> but at any rate, so this was a copy I had done. I guess the point of showing this, because this is yeah. all new to me, was something I had done at the age of 10. And did it influence me? Yes. To this day, I would say that the comic strip storytelling has been probably the most important facet of my life as an artist. It was growing up with that. And you'd have to keep in mind, and there are some of you whose hair is my color, who will, re who will remember that the comic strip was looked down as a very lowly form. And now you have pop art. And a lot of pop art was just lifted from the comic strips. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that influenced you growing up. You absolutely loved pouring over the comics, as you well, said, and drawing from them. Well, what I was going to point out, which I think is so unique, that you recognized early on that it was a passion that you had, and you were very good at it. But your father also recognized that. And well, there's a story, I used to be very sensitive about sharing, but I think now it's, um, when I tell it, it, it'll, I hope, make sense to a lot of you. And one thing you can do with, um, with the arts. Years ago, I was painting a man named Robert Frelke, who was Secretary of the Army during Vietnam. And he had come from Minnesota, he was in the insurance business, and Melvin Laird brought him in, and he became Secretary of the Army. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, I envy you your profession because you used to see what you were like at every stage of your life. What's well, true. Uh, as a creative person, you can see what you wrote, what you composed, what you drew. And I can look back over really, uh, at the age now of almost 92, look back at what I did at the age of 10 and 12, and I would have said, that's a t talented kid. Uh, but the age, and I, I really feel this is so important, to me at least, to realize and appreciate the time at which a person lived, to keep your eye on the past, because everything we're responsible for today has happened before. And the idea of leaving school, and this is the point of the picture, the idea of leaving school at the age of 14, 15, you didn't do it. Today, as I did with my children, they wanted to find themselves so they would drop out of college for a year. Not unusual. But when I grew up, you didn't have psychiatrists. You didn't, you, you, you had a work ethic and you loved your parents and you worked goddamn hard. And my father, who loved me and I was an only child, I was very unhappy, I'm sorry to make this a long story, I was very unhappy in school. I was an A student, an honor student, uh, and went to a, a school that was only for academic level, but for kids with talent. And I was so unhappy there that I decided I wanted to leave at 15. A lot of this I don't even understand myself, but I looked at an ad in the newspaper, and they wanted inkers for comic books. 30, no, I think it was 15 or $20 a week for a six-day week, and I applied. It was during World War II, and so most of the men were gone, and here I was. And I went to my father, which is the point of the story, <clears throat> and said I wanted to leave school, and. Uh, I think back on this and I think, how could he have let me do this? And I'm convinced that A, he loved me, that he knew I was a good kid and was passionate about art. But I was a healthy kid. I mean, I played baseball. I had this tooth knocked out by some little kid. That I, <laughs> but, um, and so I left school when I was not quite 16. And I really think it's because my father loved me and maybe he saw something in me uh, when I got my, my an honorary degree a couple of years ago from Rollins College, I said, I wish my father had been alive to see this. Yeah, wonderful. But it was an instinct on his part. And I, I talked to Shane, whose daughter, Maddie, is, is so talented. And I said, I think 
Most young people are talented with the arts, but what you should do, I believe, is encourage them. Give them the opportunity. And I think my father sensed in me, this is how I read it, this is a good kid, he loves, he loves this. And he said to me something I never forgot. I wish I could say I lived up to it. But he said to me when I was not quite 16, he said, you're a lucky young man. You're gonna be able to earn your living doing something you love, don't you ever forget it. Not bad, not bad. Not bad at all. Here's some examples of some of the work that you did when you were in school studying. And you can see, uh, well, I had, well, we had another one in there, but let's just skipped over. But let, let's talk a little bit about a teacher you encountered when you were at the Art Students League Well, I took, I took a, um, uh, a job as an ink and comic books. And I was all of about 16 or 17, and there was an old timer in the shop. He must have been 30, really old. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, kids, you know, you need a lot of training. Because I was doing Coca-Cola bottles. I was doing pop art. At that time, we didn't know it was pop art. And I was doing comic strips. And some of you are old enough to remember something called pulp magazines. They were called pulp magazines because the paper they were printed on was the cheapest kind of paper. But it's where, if you read mysteries, where Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, James M. Cain, all the great fiction writers started out doing pulps. They were paid, let's say, 10 cents a word. They were the pre-runner uh, and a pre pre-forecaster of paperback books. They were about so big, and there were about eight or 10 stories in every issue, and each story had a little black and white illustration so that you'd open it and say, that sounds interesting. And to give you a statistic which bewilders me, in the 19, late 40s and 50s, there were almost 200 pulp magazines a month. They were lurid, they were colorful, there were a lot of writers and artists who started doing them, uh, do, started their careers drawing them and writing for them. And they were very, very popular. They were detectives, cowboys. In fact, there was an article done on me in People Magazine and the title was, he went from cowboys and cleavage into portraits. <laughs> because you'd always saw a pretty girl with a heaving bosom. Nothing's changed. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was part of our culture the pulp magazines, and so I was doing them, and I had the, um, I'm not sure it was a bug, but I had a feeling there was something more out there. I didn't know where I was going. I was earning a living. I was enjoying what I did. I was terribly stimulated reading uh, and selecting as I'd read a story, what would make a good picture, storytelling. Movies had an enormous influence, as you will see as we, when we wind this down, um, I was going to the movies all the time and never knowing that 40 years later that Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and John Wayne and Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Cagney and Katherine Hepburn and uh, Roy Rogers and Dale, that they would all eventually pose for me. I was using them then as images for my comic books. Yeah. So this old timer in the shop, lest you think where i have forgotten where I was going, which I did, <laughs> said to me, kids, you need some training. And I said, what do you mean by training? He said, well, you ought to learn to draw and paint from life and do landscape. And you want to be an artist. There's more to it. And so I went to the Art Students League. And I don't know how many of you can think of people beyond your immediate family who have influenced you and that you're grateful to. But I was 16, and I went to the Art Students League, and I saw a painting by a man named Frank Dumond, who had been born in 1865. And I looked at that painting, and I assure you, I see it as clearly as I see you. I, I remember the painting. And I went and studied with Mr. Dumont, and I took life painting and drawing in the afternoon, and in the summers I went with him to Vermont and painted landscape. And he was of another breed of man that one does not see today. He, like many others, uh, were self-educated, extremely bright, uh, street smarts, and tough and love this country, and love the work ethic. And he, uh, the studio I'm in today in New York was Mr. Dumont's, and he took a shine to me and affected my life enormously. And I remember if I were to pick one thing about Mr. Dumont, I said to him one day, I was all of about 17, I said, you know, Mr. Dumont, I think I'm learning how to paint. And he looked at me and he said, 
I'm trying to teach you how to see and observe. Mm. And that was the key. Yeah. Oh, I know, that was a little sketch I did of a yeah. little girl when I was about 17 or 18. Didn't Dumont also teach, uh, huh? at one time, didn't Dumont also teach Norman Rockwell? No, uh, Mr. Yeah, that was another thing. You know, I talked to you before about narration, <clears throat> and, and I think I referred to the past. And I am very, very passionate in looking back at what's been done before. And Mr. Duman, and this was part of the great fun in my career, the number of people that I met that had touched on other people before them. So when I was with Mr. Dumont, among the people who had studied with him were Georgia O'Keeffe, Norman Rockwell. And so I was being fed all this past constantly. Mm -hmm. And it affects me to this very day. And some examples of the work that you did in comic books at that well, tender age of 17, 18 years old, Zorro. When, well, I was doing, doing comic books. Um, again, if I can keep, ask you to keep in mind, if you will, uh, how much the past has meant to me and how much storytelling has meant to me. I was, um, uh, in, in a certain flash of modesty, I will tell you, I was reasonably sensitive to the fact that I had dropped out of school. It's not the way it is today, where people say, oh, I dropped out. I was terribly ashamed of it. People would say to me, what college did you graduate from? And I'd say, well, I, I, I didn't graduate. Where did you go? And I, well, I didn't go to college. Well, what high school did you graduate? I didn't graduate. <laughs> I, and I was very self-conscious of it. What I didn't realize is that I was reading constantly, that I had a desire to learn more. And I did have, I think, in all fairness, a work ethic that I really loved doing. I never forgot what my father said. I was aware of it to some degree. Uh, and so in the course of doing the comic books and the pulp magazines, I was also doing paperback covers. And uh, so I was reading constantly. And uh, among the comic strips I did, I did some superheroes that had today been revived, like Hawkman. And then I was working on um, a series I created called the Zorro Books. They had originally been uh, fiction that it was <clears throat> made into motion pictures with Tyrone Power and Douglas Fairbanks and Anthony Banderas and Anthony Hopkins. But I was doing the comic books, The Shadow, um, which was also a very popular radio program with Orson Welles. And I was doing the comic book Zorro and... Hulkman. Oh, Pulps. Hawkman was another. Hawkman was one yeah. of the superheroes. Yeah. But at the same time, I was very um, attracted to, to painting. And the key for me, you know, again, it's very easy for me to look back. It's like looking at a picture of me when I was 12, and I think, my God, what a good looking kid. <laughs> that doesn't mean I look like that today. <laughs> so. Um, well, you're I very can... pretty, you always <laughs> tell me, very pretty. So I, I can look back at that and. Um, feel what I felt at the time, which was I wanted to get better as an artist. It was never, it was never money. It was never to be a commercial success. I paid my bills. I had a work ethic I got from my father. But I loved working. I loved the challenge of interpreting people. And so if, if, if uh, stories came up for, let's say, hardbound books, uh, I was not the guy you'd call upon to do airplanes or rocket ships. But if it was guy-girl stuff, romance, westerns. Now, this had a profound effect that when I went to paint John Wayne, I was out of illustration for 20 years. But what did I do for all those years before? I did hundreds, and I mean hundreds, upon hundreds of western illustrations. And so when I began to paint people, this was where I had my strength. And I was smart enough to realize that um, this is the area I should be pursuing. So you, you were spending your career doing illustration, sort of a gun for hire, doing all types of illustrations. Yeah, someone, someone forgive me for it. Yeah. Someone said to me once, what was inspiration? I said, the telephone. <laughs> that phone would ring and they had a job for me. I was ready to. <laughs> well, w one of my favorite stories you've told me before, it's sort of like this. It's not the, the very piece you said, but uh, that you did a lot of nautical things. But one day you got a phone call about doing well, a cover. Someone said, Mom, years ago, who had been one of my favorite authors, he said, um, he said, only two types in life can make their own, so to speak, the artist and the thief, because they have to think on their feet. 
And I, I went from job to job, week to week, to pay rent, to survive. And I remember going up to uh, one of the publishers, Stuhl, Sloan, and Pierce one day, and I said, well, Mrs. Schachter, do you, I was about 20 years old, do you have any job for me this week? Well, she said, Raymond, we are uh, nothing really for you. We're the only thing we're doing this week or this month or in the future, we're reviving a book called The Sea Witch, which was written by a professor of history at Dartmouth. I can't remember his name right now. Um, and she said, I know that's not what you do. I said, oh, the sea? <laughs> Clipper ships? My greatest love. Oh, she said, I didn't know that. <laughs> And I had remembered years before meeting an illustrator. And he said, I was, they used to call me Kid for 20 years. He said, Kid, if you, if you take from one, meaning if you steal from one, it's plagiarism. But if you take from many, it's research. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what I did was, um, I went to the public library and they used to have, and they still do it, what they call a picture file. And all the illustrators would go up there and, for instance, you would have a job to do on um, airplanes. And they'd look up and they'd take out these pictures the way you would books. And so I went to the public library and I took out everything I could find on clipper ships. I bought the National Geographic's old ones. And I remember they were written by a man named Alan Villiers around the Cape in a clipper ship. And I did my research. And what pleased me, and I thought about it often, they sent, I did little watercolor sketches. You see, what you do is you would, you'd read the book, and then you'd come up with little ideas, which I would do in watercolor, about eight by 10, and they would approve them. We like this, we don't like that, or do that and change it to this. And they took the four watercolors I had done for the Sea Witch, and they sent them up to, I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name, who was a full professor of history at Dartmouth. And he wrote back and he said, I'm so glad you found a man who was conversant with and understood the sea. <laughs> well, I learned a great lesson from that, that if you use your brains and imagination and you have some passion and honesty, you can learn about a lot of things. And um, uh, so that, that's when I did some of this. Then I had a brief spell where I was drafted in the <laughs> army. A little brief spell in World War II. Well, World War II. Yeah. And, um, that, that interrupted things for a little while. No, well, I was very lucky in one sense as an artist. The war was winding down, and I had made some friends, and I think I had a, a reputation that was promising. And a lot of the editors in New York would send me scripts which I did when I was stationed then at that point in New Jersey, and I would do a drawing a week, big pen and inks, $8 a piece, and I then would go into New York on my day off and I would deliver the drawing and they'd give me another job. So that for the period I was in the service, I was being published three and four drawings a month in the magazines. Wow, wow. Well, what I think is so interesting is you were, you were making your livelihood as an artist you were still taking some classes uh, periodically at the Art Students League. You go into the military, but when you leave the military, you think that you're gonna to return to exactly the same life that you had before, but it wasn't the same, was it? And you tried to go back to the League and even take well, some classes. There was a book by, not Tom Wolfe, but Thomas Wolfe, who was from North Carolina, called You Can't Go Home Again. And I think the period I was in the service, I really wanted to get back to work. Uh, you know, that business of service will make you a man. I was already out of school. I was working, and I wanted to get back to. And I had, I think, maybe $30, $30 in the bank and a lot of hopes. And I, I came back, and I thought, I want to go back to the Art Students League in the afternoon and paint and do my freelance work. And I remember going back to the League in the afternoon and registering and starting to paint, and I said, that's over. That's gone. And I left the school and, and worked full time. The one thing I, th I think as I look back, if I may, is, is that the consuming interest in people, I never lost. It's the hook to this day that keeps me going. I'm fascinated by it. There's one basic difference. And I want to mention this, if I may. Um, 
in giving talks about art, you have different kind of audiences. You will have a group who are artists. They don't give a damn what it was like to paint Donald Trump or to paint Ronald Reagan or to paint John Wayne. They want to know what kind of brushes you use, what kind of paints you use. <laughs> then I'll get another audience that don't care what kind of paints I use, <laughs> what kind of brush. They want to know what was Miss Hepburn like. <laughs> I'm ready. And then you get a mixed group. And the one thing I learned a long time ago is never talk down or cross or sideways to people. Uh, my father gave me another piece of advice once, said always treat people the way they treat you. And that was not bad advice either. But people have been a hook for me. But there was one basic difference, and I think all of you will, regardless of what your profession is, will understand this. When I was doing illustration, I would get my friend Shane, and I said, Shane, I want you to come in. I'm doing some Bizarro books, or I'm doing a cover, an Agatha Christie cover, <clears throat> or an Aldous Huxley cover, and I'm going to change you into a, a fat man with blonde hair. I want you to sit in the chair, and I'd pose you. It didn't matter if it looked like him. When, you got, when I got into portraits, then you painted individuals rather than types. Very, very big difference. You know what I mean, Joanna, about that. You're painting individuals. It's very, very different than painting types. And an interesting thing also, for what it's worth, happened to me. When I was doing illustration, and I began to get a little bit better money instead of $8 a piece for a drawing, I was getting three or $400 for a cover, I could then afford models. So I remember going to, a, there was a Conover agency and, and John Robert Powers agency, and I would hire a model for 50, it was a lot of money then, by the way, it's not the way it is today. It'd be the equivalent of probably $500 or $1,000 to get a model. And I was using these very good looking guys and gals, and I couldn't get any juice out of it at all. And then I found out and discovered something else. It's all feeling. Get actors. And so I remember there was a fellow named Steve Holland who was playing Flash Gordon on TV. And he was a good looking guy, but no different than anybody you see at a gas station or in a department store. But he was an actor. And what he was able to do was give me the feeling of something so I'd Say, Steve, I need to, I'm doing a Western sheriff now. And he would take the Winchester and the hat and he'd sit in a chair. <laughs> so I found that feeling, which I got from actors, you know, you could get the feeling of something. One quick story about John Wayne and feeling. Wait, 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 hang on oh, to that. Okay. We'll see John Wayne in a minute. Let me just say real quickly that he did answer the call of Uncle Sam. But you, you knew Uncle Sam in a slightly different way than what most people did. Not a, well, not really at that time. The, the, the pictures they're showing you, can you go back a step? Yeah. I think unquestionably the most famous poster, the most familiar poster ever done was this one of Uncle Sam. And it was done by an illustrator named James Montgomery Flagg, who was a legend in his day to this degree when Flagg died in 1960, he'd been out of the scene for 20 years, so to speak. Time Magazine, 1960, gave him a full page, a full page under National Affairs with three reproductions. And the conclusion was based on his interpreting the mores and morales of his period, he was the most important United States artist of his day. Well, in 1917, my father, who was in World War I, told me, remember they had no radio then, no television, no motion pictures. He said, we used to buy magazines because we would see on the cover uh, a Charles Dana Gibson painting. It had illustrations by Howard Chandler Christie or Howard Pyle or James Montgomery Flagg. He said they were like movie stars. Well, Mr. Flagg had done that I Want You poster it's been misquoted as saying it was a self-portrait, it was not. <clears throat> uh, I got it from a pretty good source, which was he told it to me. <laughs> but uh, he did that cover for Leslie's Weekly in one hour, and it became, as he modestly said, the most famous poster in the world, which it was. 
And I got to know him not when I was in the Army, but when I came out through friends, I got to know Flagg. And I gave the eulogy at his funeral when he died in 1960, along with an illustrator named Dean Cornwell, whom I understand, Joseph, has murals here in Nashville. Is that That's true? Right. That's yeah. right. Where are they? At the county courthouse. And Cornwall was, Cornwall was making in 1920 $200,000 a year, which is equivalent of $6 million today. Amazing. Amazing. Flagg was the highest priced illustrator. Here's some of Flagg's. Well, that was Flagg. He was very well known for pen and inks, humor. Uh, well, it, when I got to know him in 1953, he was really the, what I would call the last phase of the great guy. He lost his vision. Uh, he dealt totally in the past, and old age and the lack of fame did not sit well with him at all. And he was also the most arrogant, at times, honorary son of a bitch. And you have to understand, I loved him. I didn't always like him. He was very unkind to people. He had a great wit and great humor, but falling out of the limelight, he, was, he had been terribly spoiled. He was strikingly good looking, with a magnificent voice. He wrote books, he wrote plays, he wrote movies. And he had th 300 illustrations a year that were published. He was a legend. And I got to know the old man, and there were really very few of us who would go near him because he insulted everybody. <laughs> uh, and a lot of his old friends would say to me, you know, Jimmy, when he was young, I wish you'd known him. And I was in my 20s, and he had just two or three people who would come around and see him. And I did this portrait, which is in my show, of Monty, um, which is owned by the National Portrait Gallery. He was a very, very big part of my life and a very big part of America, a very big part of this country. Yeah. This that is was you. a self-portrait. Charcoal? Huh? Charcoal. Charcoal drawing. 1949, about that same time. And oh, this was the first, first cover I ever sold, and I think it's very, uh, I think I got maybe $35 for it. It was a big oil painting, but if you look at it, it was called 15 Western Tales. I think it was, what, 25 cents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just, 25 cents. That was what sold pulp magazines. They were fast, they were action, they were colorful, uh, some were very sexy, not by today's standards. This was one of the first covers. It's a terrible reproduction. It's awful. It was done from, the sky was not like that, but it was a Zane Gray Western called Riders of the Purple Sage. Next. <laughs> uh, this, this, is a, uh, this is one of the covers I most hate. And when Shane showed that me, I said, why did you put this one in? What I used to do, you, you've heard this with actors. They're between engagements. But what does an actor do in between? Well, an, a creative person has the advantage that I was always between engagements. We would do sketches. We would do drawings. Musicians would play their instrument or compose. Writers would write. But what do actors do? They have to wait for a part. Well, as an, act, as an artist between engagements, I would do little watercolor sketches and then take them up to the publishers. How about this one? Yeah, we can use that. So I did one, uh, this one, of the Cowboys, there was only one difference, and I, this is why I let him put this in, because it's not one of my favorites. But by the way, look at the title, Gun Feud at Stampede Valley. That was it, <laughs> bang, bang, bang. I brought this little watercolor up, and the art director said, put a gun in his hand. And I said, it's stupid. <laughs> well, so this was added at the bottom. And you see, it makes no difference at all. But that, I think it's also maybe of interest to understand that the publishers were out, is this no different today, to get you and you and you to buy a book? And I would have to put sex in books and sexy women in who never appeared. And this was an example of a, uh, where's the cover? That's the original. Right. Yeah. I did a cover, I was commissioned to do a cover by D.H. Lawrence called Women in Love. And what was selling then was cleavage. <laughs> so, I got I a think model. It's still selling. I think it's <laughs> I got a model, <laughs> and I, I did this, and I brought it up to the publisher, and they, then they was they were beginning to get a a code to clean up the comics, clean up the pulps, and they said we can't have it this way. So I took casein. For those of you who are not artists, is a water-based medium that goes on. It can cover, and you can watch it off with water. 
And they said, we can't have all that cleavage. So I took some white casein paint, painted it across here, which eliminated this. And then when I got it back, I wiped it off. <laughs> Next. Oh, this was, again, typical, Chattels of El Dorado. Uh, all the books, could, the, many of the books were very bland, colorless. Many of them, in my opinion, were not even well written. Now, this one was an, a, a well-known Somerset Maugham book and very, very good, but they wanted the scene where the hero, the James Bond character, sends the girl off to prison. And so this is what motivated a lot of the, mm -hmm. the books. This was a, I was also in the effort, again, I think the word survive is very, very important to me. I think of this when I see younger people and they want to know about art. Uh, you've got to survive. You really uh, have to learn what it is to make a living. And I would ask you to believe that whatever I did, and some were not much fun, I really did it with a full heart, the best of my ability. And I found there was a great market for children's books because what was happening, which I didn't touch on, was the culture in this country was changing. The pulp magazines began to fade away because of television and paperbacks began to come in. Well, here I was, 20 some odd years old, I had rent to pay, uh, a living to make, and so I went into children's books and began to do children's books. This was the last book I ever illustrated, it was a book on Giuseppe Verdi, um, that was probably around 19, in the 50s. 1950s. Well, this is one of my favorite stories of all time that you tell, and this is about that period, late 1950s. Mm -hmm. You're living at the National Arts Club in Gramercy Park, where you still are today, 65 plus years later. And in the 1950s, you began to honor people at the Arts Club well, with gold medals. I was very lucky. I mean, you may remember, if, if you do, <clears throat> that I had mentioned uh, Frank Vincent Dumond, who was my teacher. I've been very fortunate in my life to have connected with people. Not purposely, but I will say that I really have and do enjoy enormously the challenge of meeting people, um, trying to understand something, trying to interpret them. And I've been very lucky to have met some interesting people along the way. And when I came out of the service, Mr. Du I said to Mr. Dumond, I've got to find a place to work and live. And he, he had a studio at a glorious land, National Historic Landmark building. And I want to tell you why it's a landmark building, because I think it's interesting. Uh, in 1876, the nominee for Democratic President of the United States was a man named Samuel Tilden, who had been governor of New York and was a lawyer who had busted something called the Boss Tweed Ring and others which sprung him to national prominence. And so he became the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. You will find this story, I promise you, as interesting as Watergate. Governor Tilden ran for president and was elected by popular vote and went to bed at Gramercy Park at his home, which is the National Arts Club, where my studio is, in 1876 as President of the United States and there was a recall over the popular vote. And so a special electoral college, I don't know the number, but that's for discussion's sake, say there were seven Democrats and seven Republicans, electoral college, who were to vote on the presidency and the legitimacy of Governor Tilden's presidency. So the seven Republicans Excuse me, the seven Democrats voted for Samuel Tilden. The seven Republicans voted for Rutherford B. Hayes. And the deciding vote, which was like the speaker of the college, was a Republican, cast one vote for Rutherford Hayes, and Tilden lost the president, this is a true story, the presidency of the United States by one electoral vote. One, not three or two, one. There were, it was rioting on the streets. Gore Vidal wrote a terrific book called 1976, based on this. Governor Tilden had lived in, a, in his building on Gramercy Park, which is a little square in the middle of Manhattan. And he did something which I think is quite extraordinary, and I defy anyone to tell me they do it today. He asked for, there was rioting on the streets, bloodshed, death, 
and he asked for two weeks to make a decision. After two weeks, Governor Tilden in essence said, I will not see the country torn 10 years after the Civil War. I accept the mandate of the Electoral College. I will never run for political office again. And as the story said, he remained a true gentleman and servant to the Republic. Mr. Tilden died and a group of leading citizens of the day, Frick, Morgan, Vanderbilt, Whitney, decided to create a club for men and women equally. Unheard of, 1898. <clears throat> they purchased the old Tilden home, which is today a National Historic Landmark. And they formed the National Arts Club with a thousand charter members, including Mr. Christie, and Frederick Remington, and the leading musicians of the day. Artists paid no dues, they gave a painting. And Mr. Dumont, in 1951, found me a studio in the National Arts Club, where I've been ever since. In the course of this, the National Arts Club to this day uh, honors people in the arts and letters. And I became, at a very young age, uh, vice president of the club, chairman of exhibitions, and I used to arrange the artist's dinners every year. And this was taken in 1956, and to the left was a South African writer, Stuart Clutie. Next to him was a lady named Gala Dali, and her husband next to a Salvador Dali. Did you have to tell the story of going over to the Gramercy Park Hotel to collect them, to take them over for the dinner? Well, one, uh, you, you have to believe that you, you see me as a very easygoing, gentle, sweet <laughs> soul. I, I know that, and I hate to shatter your illusions, <laughs> but I'm going to. In 1956, I was a little bit hot under the collar, and I was our chairman. And you have to understand, I was trying to make a living, and I was uh, quite human. And I was told that Senior Dolly, who had agreed to be honored at the dinner, wanted to be picked up at his hotel. And I said, well, who's going to do it? And they said, well, you were, after all, the chairman of the exhibition committee. Well, I said, I'm not going to pick that son of a bitch up. He wants to come down. Well, it was a question that we forfeit the dinner and Mr. Dolly. So now, this I, is Salvador Dolly, right? Salvador Dolly. OK. <laughs> uh, the first mistake I made was, was I said, hello, Dolly. And <laughs> he didn't talk to me after. I'm serious. He didn't talk to me after. Uh, so I went to the St. Regis Hotel and in my tuxedo with George Duberg, the club treasurer, who was quieting me down. I was really bristling. I thought, well, let him come down. Anyway, I went up there. but said, you know, we've got 200 people coming to the dinner. You're going to throw it up because you don't want to have to go and pick him up? So out came uh, Senorita, Senora Dali, and to this day I don't know what this meant, but she came over to me and I took her hand and shook it. She said, she looked at me and said, I would love to torture you. <laughs> so then off the elevator with his walking stick and mustache, he had his mustache one thing, came Senor Dali. And his, I want you to shake hands with me. I'm going to be Dali. And you say, hello, Mr. Dali. Hello, Mr. Dali. Enchanté. <laughs> Well, you have no idea how this endeared me to him. <laughs> and I was mumbling under my breath, and, and this is also quite true. There was a, um, he said, we are going, he used the word le, I remember, instead of the. He was Spanish, but he used the French le. And he referred to himself as le Dali, as if he were somebody else. <laughs> le Dali is coming to dinner, but le Dali is bringing friend. And with that, this youngish man, and a, I remember a great double-breasted child, came down in the lobby of the St. Regis Hotel with an ocelot on a chain. <laughs> I mean, you can push me so far. <laughs> so um, I said, well, you can't bring that beast to the... He said, if le ocelot no come, le Dali no come. So there we were in a limousine <laughs> with an ocelot. <laughs> And things quieted down, and I asked him if he would come up to the studio and let me do a sketch of him. Again, I, I would hate to ever think of myself as a wise guy, but I was not in the best of moods, and I was sketching him, and his mustache went like this. 
And I said, Mr. Dolly, if I may ask you, I notice you have, well, all the great artists receive a message from, <laughs> and Le, Le Dolly receive message. <laughs> he said, like antenna. <laughs> I said, well, how does this happen? He said, well, Le Dolly have the mustache. And I said, I don't know why I did this. I said, well, Michelangelo must have gotten better messages. What? <laughs> Michelangelo, better message than Dali. Dali have the mustache. And I said, yes, yes. But Michelangelo had beard and mustache. <laughs> well, I, I mean this. He did not talk to me during <laughs> dinner or afterwards. I was persona non whatever. Well, that was my time. With and you got but, I, but, I, but I did, through the years, through the National Arts Club, get to meet an extraordinary amount of people from Eleanor Roosevelt, they would all be at these dinners, and I was our chairman, and Ayn Rand, and I would go after people to speak at our dinners that I felt were creative people. And I remember with Ayn Rand, who some of you may remember, for she has a great following, the Fountainhead, and a lot of um, uh, financial people follow her assiduously. Uh, and I would, I would try and get personalities that I felt were creative to come to our dinners, and I said, let me figure out Get me, the, get me Mrs. Roosevelt, I'll work her in somehow. And so when we brought her down, I had them speak about her travels and try to connect it with culture. Next. Well, oh, this was when. So this is, this is the transitional period. When you get to the late 1950s, as everyone knows, television is brought into our living rooms. People are going out to the movies even more. And they're turning to books and magazines less and less than they did before. So suddenly, the illustration jobs were not coming to you the way they had come to you oh. for at least a decade or more. And you began to make a transition into that, that painting. Was a, that was a turning point, and that's why I think of Somerset Maugham's The Artist Lives by his, Like the Thief by His Wits. I had to survive, uh, and I don't mind to make this life or death. I was making a decent living, and I was brought up that you pay your rent on time, you don't owe people money, and you treat people the way they treat you. Uh, but I also loved drawing and painting, and I would go in the summers and paint landscapes. I wanted to grow as an artist, and I was stimulated and excited by everything. Yeah. So I painted, and, and um, the field of illustration dropped out. It, it's culturally interesting that suddenly design began to take over, lettering sophisticated design, and pictorial things didn't mean that much. And with the comic books, I was considered part of what they called a hard-boiled school. Tough guys, cowboys, and they went for gentler. The books, are we gonna do Dr. Seuss on that? Yeah. 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 Okay, and the, and, the, and the books became more gentle, more children's books, and I had to make a living. So, well, so, you, so you go down to Portraits Incorporated, which is- Well, what I, what I was yeah. doing is here, here and there when I was doing illustration, Again, with this consuming interest in people, I would ask friends to pose. And I began to have a group of portraits available that I had painted. And I had heard of an agency called Portraits Incorporated, which represented all the top portrait painters of the day. And I went up with my samples, and they were very interested. And they said, well, we can't take you on and list you as a member of our company until you actually get some commissions from us. So here's the, this story. Uh, I got a call from them within the week that a young man of 25 named Forrest Mars had come in with his, with his wife, they had just married and had a young child, and that his mother had said to him, for your 25th birthday, go up to the gallery and pick an artist and uh, send us the bill, that's your 25th birthday present. And they showed him my work and he came down to see me. We got along very well and it was decided I would paint Forest Mars. Well, two years ago, I had a show at the Brinton Museum in Wyoming and Forest Mars had one of his properties which was 100,000 acres in Montana. So this is the Mars Candy Company. Well, wait, wait. No? Wait, Sorry, wait, still. Wait, wait, wait. I came in too soon. <laughs> um, and, and I asked Forrest, who had helped endorse the museum and support it, if he would pose for me. We remained friends from that day through 50 some odd years. 
When he died a year later, sadly, of a heart attack or that fall, his personal worth was $27 billion. His brother, 20, the three of them, it was Mars Candy, Uncle Ben's Rice, Dove Bars. So here was this 25-year-old kid that we, we became friends at the age of 25. And because of Forrest, who was in sponsoring the museum, he said he wanted his friend Ray Kinster to have a show at the museum out there. And he posed for me. And so I mention this because of sometimes the connections, which are quite innocent, of friendships made and restored and maintained, revived. Um, and so that was the first board. There were a few high spots in my life. And I would ask you to believe that I was working every day. I was a workaholic. I got a call from um, the other night, uh, a couple of years ago, no, a couple of months ago, I was, do I was doing a book talk on the last book, and I was showing slides. And I looked around the audience, and there were people there of every age. And I said, one of the things that intrigues me and disappoints me is the total lack of curiosity about what went before. It shocks me. It disappoints me. I'm not just talking about celebrities. I'm talking about people in the arts who don't know what went before. And everything's available today. When I grew up, we didn't have TV, didn't have all these art books. And I was getting to the next slide, and I said, how many people in the audience here, and there were about 300, know the name of the first man in space? How many of you know the first man in space? Anybody want to tell me the first man in space? Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard. There was only one person in the audience who knew Alan Shepard. Oh. Well, in 1963, I received a commission um, from the uh, United States Navy Combat Art Collection to paint Scott Carpenter, who was the part of the original seven Mercury astronauts, and the second man to orbit, John Glenn being the first. And so I painted this portrait of Carpenter. Now, I could talk about some of these people really for a while that I think might intrigue you, what that spacesuit was like, the friendship we made that lasted till his death a couple of years ago. And Scott Carpenter was one of the high spots of my life. He was a Navy combat art uh, flyer about to be mustered out when he was called for the space program. And I painted Scott. He came to New York. There are stories in all of this, right down to the, I, I had that spacesuit in my studio, and I will tell you, when he put it on for me one day, it was put on like a one piece that came up from his legs. The neck piece went over this way. You screwed the helmet on. The gloves were screwed on. Every finger had a light in it. On his chest was a mirror that would reflect the mirror across from the instruments. And I spent hours with, with Scott learning, absorbing, enjoying. We talked everything from family to language to words. He was the most curious, inquisitive man. And I mention him particularly for a reason. Hold that, if you will. Okay. Um, uh, two years later, I was commissioned to paint Alan Shepard, who was America's first man in space. And what I guess I'm trying to say to you is how lucky I have been in my life to have touched on the many people I have, and the connecting, which is quite innocent. Because 20 years after this portrait, I had a call from Bill Blair, who was a friend of mine, who was publisher of Atlantic, Atlantic or Harper, Atlantic Magazine. And he said, um, a good friend of mine, he said, is a writer named Tom Wolfe, uh, who was then the hottest writer there was. It was my generation. And he wants to meet you. And I said, well, why, why in the world would Tom Wolfe want to meet me? He didn't know. Well, he's doing a book on the astronauts, the first astronauts. And he knows that you knew Shepard, that you were a very close friend of Scott Carpenter's. And that led to my getting together with Tom Wolfe, who not only became a subject and a close friend, but this all began to go like this. Everywhere I touched, it was beginning to connect, but innocently. Um, and anyway, now go ahead. So we, uh, I'm now moving up to about 1978. Now, what I want to mention to you, if I may, is that if I start to tell you stories about John Smith or Mary Jones, you say, who are they? So we've obviously picked names that you can connect with because they've been part of our culture. I had a call in 1978 
You know, there are, there are people, I can't believe it, people who are interested in film and theater who never heard of John Wayne. By the way, he's dead 35 years. That's a long time. I got a call, and I was getting very, I'll never forget this, I was getting very, very busy. And the last thing I wanted to do was travel. And the phone rang one afternoon, and it said, oh, Ray, this is Rich Muno. Well, Rich was the assistant director of the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. And he said, we were hoping you'd come out here. Uh, we got a portrait for you to do. And I said, well, I'm not traveling, Rich. I, you'd have to bring your subject here. I just, I can't travel right now. When would this be? He said, we were hoping you'd come out Friday. This was like Tuesday. <laughs> I said, what year? He said, this Friday. I said, Rich, you've got to be kidding. I said, I, I can't come out any Friday for the next six months. Oh, and he said, this was a quote. He said, oh, gosh. He said, we had Duke all lined up. I said, Duke, Duke? <laughs> I knew immediately. Well, where do you think I was Friday morning? <laughs> Del Webb's New Porter Inn, sitting in the lunchette, which had these cushions, you know, these plastic cushions, yeah, yeah. banquets, yes. the table. I was sitting here. Space for Mr. Wayne was here. And across from me was Dean Crakel, the director, his son, and Jane, and, and Bob Norris, who was in the cattle business with John Wayne. And we were waiting for Duke. And one of the images and sounds and moments I remember is when he came in wearing suntans like this, rolled up, no socks, beach sneakers, brown polo shirt. He, not many people know he had a toupee, and it was a pretty good one. But when he went to sit down, I heard this, when he, and the, it was like some ship that landed in the, the air went out of the pillows when he sat. And his, I remember his shoulder being up, he was very big. He was six foot four, but he was very large from here up. I mean, large, big hands, large head. And um, I didn't know where we were going. This was brunch around 11 o'clock in the morning. And we were making, and I happened to, um, I had a book with me I had done called Painting Portraits. And in the front I had done a little pen and ink. Remember now, I told you, I used to do Western illustrations, and I did a little pen and ink of a cowboy on a horse with a Winchester like that, followed by some Indians, and I had inscribed it to Duke from his admiring fan, da 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 And I said to Bob Norris, who was in the cattle business with him, and was, by the way, the first Marlboro man. He was a cattle rancher, owned mountains in Colorado. And I said, what happens next? He said, I don't know. He said, he's kind of looking you over. <laughs> no, John Wayne was not about to just say, come on out to the house. And he had been painted, uh, sort of a sad story, he'd been painted by Norman Rockwell. And Wayne was a real gentleman. And I was told he did not, nobody in the family liked Mr. Rockwell's painting, including Mr. Wayne, but Mr. Wayne would never say so, but they wanted to replace it. Well, I... I have a great admiration for Norman Rockwell. I think he was a goddamn genius. Um, anyway, the next step was I, I said to Bob Norris, I said, I've got this book for Mr. Wayne. And apparently he saw the pen and ink in the front. He, he went, oh, God, this is great. Come on out to the house. <laughs> so he went out to the house, and he was imposing. There was nothing in the house that was a movie star. It was on a, a bay. Um, it was a gated community. And a couple of things came up. One was, uh, I have to believe that some of you are old enough to remember people like Clark Gable. And something came up, it was very amiable. There were just six or seven of us, if that, in his living room, which was totally unpretentious. Western paintings, but basically a man's house, lived in water. And he was just as that. He was very much the way he was in the movies. And um, something came up about the, the portrait of Norman Rockwell, and he was very self-conscious about it. He said, well, I know Michael doesn't like it, and Patrick doesn't like it, and he said, but why, what's, what's Mr. Rockwell going to do with an ugly old bastard like me? And he said, I guess, uh, and I said, well, well, you know, actually, Mr. Wayne, it's none of those things. And he was, he was, he really, I said, what do you, what do you, what do you think it is? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I think it is, Mr. Wayne. I said, Mr. Rockwell is a great hero of mine. 
And if you'd gotten Mr. Rockwell 10 years earlier, I wouldn't be here. But I said, I think Mr. Rockwell's in some stages of, um, uh, what's the Dementia or? Huh? D dementia. D well, it's a form of dementia. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. Uh, and I knew this to be so, by the way, that Mr. Rockwell was having problems. And I said, uh, Mr. Rockwell's a great, great artist. And you know, to me, you're a, you and Mr. Rockwell should be on Mount Rushmore. But I said, he's, Mr. Rock was sadly just losing his ability to. And whatever it was, we connected. And I realized he was looking me over because he was not about to agree to just pose for any artist to do it. He, his son told me he was painted every week by somebody oh. would send him a picture. And they would say, this is a gift to you, Mr. Wayne. And he said, my father used to write it, a letter saying, or his secretary would, <clears throat> Mr. Wayne thanks you so much for the, your fine example, showing this fine example of your, and he returned it to them because he didn't want them to be able to say my paintings in his collection. Oh. But he was, uh, I exchanged letters with him and I remembered um, he wrote to me at one point, I mean, this is a quote and it was delicious. When I, when I did a little sketch of him, which I sent him in a letter, he wrote me back, he said, in the parlance of photography, your art is a negative of that which the other fellow likes. Well, I noticed that these, these letters which were typewritten, and he then signed it in Penn Duke, he had gone back and put a comma <clears throat> or an exclamation point. He was very articulate, and one of the things that was said about him was, uh, I didn't know how to say ain't until I got into the movies. <laughs> and I, we asked him once about Clark Gable, and for those of you who might be old enough to remember, Clark Gable was the biggest movie star in the world. And somebody said to, to John Wayne, um, it's a shame you and Gable never made a movie. Well, he said, hell, I wanted to. And when Clark came back from World War II, we agreed we'd make a movie together. He said, I said, what happened? He said, well, he wanted to know who was gonna get top billing. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, hell, Clark, let's flip a coin. Heads, you got it, tails, I got it. And I said, what happened? He said, he wouldn't risk it. <laughs> That's show business. It was not going to be Wayne and Gable. Whereas I think Wayne would have said, hey, you flipped, I lost. But he was not going to hand it to him. Uh, I did the painting. There are some lawyers here tonight, I think. Am I correct? Yes. I did a painting of John Wayne, and I did something instinctively, uh, which don't ask me to explain because I can't. But it was happening a little bit. I put a C on my signature. I was paid by the Cowboy Hall of Fame for the portrait. And I put a C on it, and I remember the director of the museum, Dean Krakel, called me. He said, hell, Ray, you got this goddamn C there, it's copyrighted. I did with the Library of Congress. I sent my $30 in, whatever it was, with a photograph of the painting and the signature with a C in front of my signature. And Dean Krakel said to me, do you mean we got to ask you every time we want to use that painting? I said, yeah. I said, but let me make it clear. I don't want to make a nickel off this. I just want to protect my, my reproduction, make sure you don't crop it or it's used indiscriminately. I don't want a nickel. I'll give you a letter that says you can use it subject to my permission, but I will never accept a nickel in fast forward. The museum had planned to use the painting on the cover. Wayne is living, by the way. This is totally important to a judge. Wayne is alive. Uh, Saturday Evening Post contacted me uh, that they wanted to use, no, they didn't contact me. They got hold of a copy of the John Wayne portrait and they got permission from the Cowboy Hall of Fame to use it on their magazine. What they didn't observe was that they were not to use it till the Cowboy Hall magazine came out first. So they went ahead and they published it and I got a call from Michael Wayne, who was John Wayne's son and I'll tell you, I was an army sergeant. I told him, I said, Michael, you talk to me this way, I'm hanging up. I mean, the air was blue with four letter words. Don't tell me about your goddamn integrity. You go ahead and sell my father's picture to the, I don't know what you're talking about. They used it without my permission. And they took my, if you can believe this, the painting was, you showed the full painting. This was the painting. My signature appeared at the lower right, I think it was. C and then Everett Raymond Kinsler.
They had taken the head off the painting, moved my signature with the C on it up onto this and printed it. Well, to telegraph and end the story, I felt so embarrassed because as he said to me, you know, you and your integrity and you were going to keep the copyright and not, and you go ahead and sell out my father. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And if you've seen this part of it in a movie, you'd think it was made up. That afternoon, I went up to the Century Club in New York to get a drink, which is a fairly prestigious club for arts and letters in west side of Manhattan. And I ran into Arthur Christie, who was my lawyer and the former assistant attorney general, Southern assistant attorney general for the Southern District of New York. And he was bringing a couple of his law partners up for drinks. And he said, Ray, come over and join us. So I went over and joined him, and then he said to them, you ought to see Ray's painting of John Wayne. John Wayne was, you know, he was the biggest star, in, without question, in Hollywood. And I said, Arthur, I've got to talk to you, and I told him the story. And he said, come over to my office next day. The gist of this was, <coughs> and this is 1978, um, New York Times had it down that artists sued the Saturday Evening Post for $12 million, infringement of contract, copyright infringement, civil rights, all kinds of things. Uh, we won the case. Now, the reason I was not driven here in private jet tonight <laughs> was when after we won the case after two and a half years of litigation, um, we, the lawyers accepted a settlement. I got zero out of it, not a nickel. Uh, and the case became actually one of the cases they use at Columbia Law School, uh, copyright infringement of an artist. And Theodore White, who was, had written a lot of books on the makings of the president, said to me, I said, why would they do a thing like this? And Teddy White said to me, listen, Ev, they figured you're an artist, you're a nice guy, you're not gonna sue him. Well, we did. And they won, they won the case, and, but it was copyright infringement. What is always the case when I spend time with Ever Emmy Kensler is that an hour goes by in about 10 minutes, and I know that the time, we're already against the wall on time. If you'll allow me just to show a couple of things, but I do want you to tell, if, if you'll stick with me for just a minute, uh, James Cagney, which is another. Quick, Dr. Two, let me bring Frank Sinatra. So, lock the doors, just lock the doors. Um, the Players Club is a club next door to me, and I am our chairman, and it was the home of Edwin Booth, whose younger brother, sad thing to remember, was John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln. And the Players Club is the theatrical club for people in the theater. And it's not Broadway so much as it is Shakespeare, London, um, Laurence Olivier, Peter O'Toole, Richard Burton, and the great American actors, the Barrymores, Spencer Tracy, Bogart, who all came off the American Broadway theater. It's theater. And the most beloved actor there was Jimmy Cagney. And Jimmy had retired from movies, and he was, some of you I hope may remember, was the, the biggest star in the, for three or four years in Hollywood. He won the Academy Award for Yankee Doodle Dandy. And they were trying to raise money for the library. And so um, his name came up, and th th a lot of these are really longer stories. I'm moving them fast. Through some friends of his who, New Cagney, he was a member of the players. He agreed to, to pose for me, and I was going to create a lithograph where we would sell them to you all for $500 each, and Cagney would have signed each one of them. Uh, there are many stories that I absolutely treasure with him. Number one, um, I remember we were hosting the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Players Club who were in New York doing Nicholas Nickleby, and we hosted them at the club one Sunday afternoon, and they were all younger people, 40 and younger. And I said to them, are there any American actors that you people really like? Oh, Cagney. I said, really? Oh, he's a national treasure. They loved his honesty, his directness, and as I said, he could do it all. Natural actor. Um, there was a dinner for him when we kicked off this. Do you have the lithograph? Yes. Uh, no, I don't actually, but we had it on the oh, right, we, had it, we had it in the room. Yeah. Anyway, we did very well with it. There was nothing in my pocket except the joy of working with him. But there was a dinner for Jimmy, 
and Jack Lemmon was there, and Travolta, and Sinatra, and there was a little private party before we went down, black tie, it was sold out. Betty Davis, Douglas Fairbanks, everybody was there. They adored Cagney. And then I got a story about Ronald Reagan connected. Two stories. <laughs> so I was in the room waiting, and in walked Frank Sinatra. Now that's my generation. And you know how shy I am, and I don't like to talk much. <laughs> so I didn't know what to say to him. And I said, oh, hi. He was going to be there to speak for, it was about 7 o'clock at night, and Caddy was sitting about over there talking to somebody. And I said to, to Frank Sinatra, I said, uh, w w when did you get here? Oh, about an hour ago, we came into some cockamamie airport in New Jersey. I said, where'd you come from? He said, from California. <clears throat> I said, you've come all this way for this dinner. Oh, yeah. Uh, I said, when are you going back? I didn't know what to say to him. I, mean, you, I didn't say the logical things like, I love your music and your, I said, when are you going back? He said, as soon as this is over. And, I, and this has got about Sinatra. I said, you mean you've come all this distance to see Cagney and speak for him and you're going right back? I remember he put his arm on mine like this and he pointed over to Cagney and he said, I would go anywhere, anytime, any place for that man. Yeah, he told me a lot about Sinatra. One quick thing about Cagney, I know I want, I'm not sure you, you know the notes. <laughs> I, at w once recently someone in the audience asked me, how did I happen to get to paint Ronald Reagan for the White House? And I said, well, look, uh, I painted Casper Weinberger, who was his Secretary of Defense. I painted George Shultz, who was his Secretary of State. I painted, uh, I've forgotten the name of the Secretary of the Interior, the Secretary of Commerce. I said, I painted eight of his cabinet officers. I'm not saying he should have selected me, but why wouldn't I be considered? <laughs> uh, when I was painting President Reagan, he and Mrs. Reagan came to my studio at the National Arts Club. And she would not let me stay alone with him, by the way. This has never happened to me. She wanted to be in the room. She was so protective of him. And I say that as a compliment, but it was very frustrating to the point that I had a hard time working because I would say, he was deaf in one ear. And I would say to him, Mr. President, what do you think of uh, the colorization of King's Row? And he, and from behind me, Mrs. Reagan would say, dear, to President Reagan, Mr. Kinsler wants to know what you thought of King's Row. So my questions were not going this way to him. They were going this way to her, <laughs> up here and back. <laughs> and you see, for me, when I work as a painter, I am very dependent upon that, someone looking at me, that I can not judge them. I don't do that. But I can get my own feelings of how to interpret them. And it was very frustrating. And then the following came up, and the reason I bring this together with the Cagney story was Mrs. Reagan said, you know, you have a great friend in Jimmy Cagney. I said, really? Oh, she said, you know, when Ron and I came to, I was Nancy Davis, she said to me, and I came to Warner Brothers, she said, Jimmy was the biggest star on the lot. And she said, you know, he was feisty, he tackled Jack Warner about the unions, and the actor being able to maintain himself. Uh, and he took a great shine to Ron and myself and really was like an uncle. And we adored Jimmy. She said, we adore Jimmy. Whenever Ron and I are coming east, Jimmy's always invited. And she said, he always talks about you. That when the, she said, Ron companions, you've got to get Ray Kensler to paint you. So here I was thinking maybe it was Schultz, maybe it was, it was Jimmy Cagney. And you also, while Nancy Reagan was there, she made the connection to Katherine Hepburn, who you had the chance to paint, and she wanted yeah. to leave a little note for Kate Hepburn. Oh yeah, I thought, uh, th there was a book written by, um, uh, what's her name, Peggy, Kate, Katie Brower, Chris Anderson's daughter? Yeah, uh, a friend of mine used to be editor of People Magazine, and his, his, his daughter, K Katherine Anderson Brower, has become a, a best-selling author. And she did a book two years ago on, called The First Ladies. And the story she's got in the book was a time I had told her when Mrs. Reagan came down with the president to see the portrait. And I had this painting, which was large. It's now in the Smithsonian. It's over life size. They've got it in the Smithsonian with her four Oscars in front of it. 
and she said, oh, Katie, my dearest, oldest friend, she got me my first job in New York. And um, she said, I've been, the reason we were late getting to you, Mr. Kinsler, was I was driving down 47th Street, <clears throat> and I wanted to see her old brownstone, and I couldn't find it. I said, well, Mrs. Reagan, she lives on 49th Street. Oh. <laughs> and she said, do you see her at all? And I said, not really. Uh, I'm not in touch with her particularly. She said, oh, you know, my oldest and dearest friend, I love her. I said, well, why don't we call her? Now, here's the first lady, and everyone I, that I ever talked to, she was very, very strong. I dialed a number, and an Irish lady named Nora, who worked for Miss Hepburn, hello. I said, Nora, this is, this is Ray Kinsler, and uh, I wonder if Miss Hepburn is there. I'm here with a friend of hers, uh, President Reagan's wife, Nancy, would like to talk to Miss Hepburn. And I was holding the phone like this, and she said, well, wait a minute, I'll see if Miss Hepburn is free. And I handed like this to Miss Reagan, the telephone. Miss Reagan, no, no, you talk to her first. <laughs> she was totally intimidated by Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> Serious. Anyway. Um, Mr. Kensler has painted every U.S. president since uh, Richard Nixon, including Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, uh, Jimmy Carter, let me flip through these as we wrap this up. That's his friend Tony Bennett, Tom Wolfe, he mentioned to you earlier. Dr. Oh, Seuss. I want to talk. Oh, bring back. Got to do that. Well, you got to do that. Final story. You got to do that. Got to do this one. Um, the dinner I think, reservations are I think shot I, at this I think point. I told Are you watching the time? Because no, I it's over. Go. It was over an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> all, I, all I'm thinking about is that taxi that I said, keep the meter going. <laughs> Um, I was working in the studio around the same time as I mentioned the John Wayne. I got a call from Dartmouth College, and um, Ed Latham, who was the assistant of the president, said, Ray, we've got a portrait we want you to do for Dartmouth of a man who's given us a chair with a great deal of money, uh, a class of 1925 Rhodes Scholar named Ted Geisel, and uh, we want a portrait of him and uh, he lives in La Jolla. I said, well, I'll, you know, delighted. When would he come to New York? Oh, he won't come to New York. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, he said he's, he lives um, in La Jolla, and he doesn't like traveling to New York. I said, well, what does he do? And they said, well, he writes children's books. And I said, well, I, I have two children. I never heard of Ted Geisel. Well, he, he writes under a pseudonym, and we'd like you to go out to La Jolla to paint him. And I said, no, I... I I said, well, what, what, I said, I, I never heard of him. He said, well, have you ever heard of a cat in a hat? Yes. <laughs> so I went, I went out to, I went out to La Jolla and had a joyful experience. I expected a, a little man with goggles and, and he was tall, silver hair, bearded, elegant in this magnificent architectural digest house that spanned the Pacific Ocean like this. It was a lighthouse. Well, Ted had made a great deal of money. I mean, multimillionaire. And he had been a Dartmouth graduate and had given a chair. Uh, Theodore Ge it was Theod his name was Theodore Geisel. And he came from Massachusetts and adopted, his middle name was Seuss, his mother's maiden name. And he began to write children's books. He never had children. But he heard things and saw things that you and I didn't. And he was an extraordinary, important figure in American culture. And I went out to um, La Jolla, and we connected right away. Just, it was almost like, I can't tell you, just as soon as we met, we liked each other. He was a very much of a loner. If, as a woman, you met him, you would feel very flattered because he was charming, he was elegant, he was funny, he was private. And there was a very, very, um, private side to him. But I think because I was an artist, and when I walked in, he took my hand like this, and he said to his wife, Audrey, God, look at Ray's finger. It's just bent, like that. I said, well, Ted, that came from my days when I was illustrating, and I used to hold the brush in this hand. And I said, actually, your company, Random House, 
<clears throat> publishes all your books under the, they still, still do to this day, under the title of Beginner Books. It's a trademark. Where if those of you who have children and have read these books know that they introduce a certain number of words and by the time the child has read the book, his vocabulary has been enlarged. That was the point of Cat in the Hat and all of those books. And I said, I think my finger bent from holding the brush. In fact, I said, the last book I ever illustrated was for your company. It was a book called Cowboy Andy. And I said, they, they were offering $5,000, which is what I earned in a year, to do this children's book. And I was not a children's book on that level illustrator. And I said, Ted, it was the worst book I ever illustrated. And he looked at me, he said, I know that book. It was the worst book anyone ever illustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Next. As Which much is as, true. As much as I hate to say it, we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm all through. But let me say this. Um, thank you for sharing these stories. Thank you for braving the snow to make it here today. It's a miracle that it really worked out. Uh, we need to do a part two, there's no doubt, because there are many other stories to tell. But another 80 years. Another 80 back. years worth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. We we'll just stay here. Oh, look, look at this. Look, look. Oh. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. Please, I thank I thank you all. I thank my dear friend, your 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 loving special talent, whom I adore this man and his family. And I want to thank Joseph Mella and Margaret Walker for providing the atmosphere, uh, the opportunity to show the pictures. I hope you'll be pleased with the selection. And um, I'll say I'll see you in 3084. There we are. <laughs> thank you.